morning, church. Good morning, good morning. Uh, We are starting a brand new series this week called All Things New, reflecting on the promise that Jesus gave us in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 5, where he says, see, I've made all things new. Now write this down, because this is true. And it's going to be a critical thing. We're going to be kind of just incrementally going through different passages in the Bible, answering questions that a lot of people have about the afterlife. We're going to be looking about what happens to our bodies, what happens to this planet, um, what happens, you know... Jesus' return, what what should our our perspective be on that? Um, The whole concept of justice and judgment. How does our story get told finally and and, and correctly? Um, The overthrow of evil. What's going to happen to animals? Have you ever wondered that? What's going to happen to animals? And one of the things that I I really, really love is just answering the question of what are we going to do? Because um, I remember, honestly, and I think I've shared this with you before, I ha- one of my kids just started crying one day because it, it, it terrified him, this concept of eternity, just like singing songs or something. Um, and that's what heaven is. And that sounded incredibly boring to him. And, and so th- that just, just was one of those, those terrible thoughts. And so the, one of the purposes of this series is to help undo some of what we've attached on and built on top of Scripture that's not in the Bible. One of those things is this idea that, that heaven is this cloud city, um, angelic place with chubby cherub harp playing baby things flying around, and that's and we're just kind of like floating, ping ponging from one like cloud to the next, and that's what heaven is. You can find that in a lot of places, just not the Bible. What we see instead is this idea of heaven itself coming down and restoring this earth, this good earth, this universe that God has crafted and created, that sin has toxified, that that you see a restoration process. So like even even the set is is trying to depict this picture of nature and creation itself by the creator descending down and restoring the planet that God created. So if you've got your Bibles, we're going to start um, in in a place um, that seems kind of odd to talk about heaven, but it's Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 29. And this passage, I mean, you're going to like totally, if you've been in church at all, you're going to pick up on this passage or maybe as a kid um, in Sunday school, you heard about this story. And so it's, it's familiar to you, but it's interesting because it starts with Jesus talking to this young guy who's, who's super wealthy. Like he's a young executive, he's got, he's, he's got all that he needs. And Jesus seems to tell him something that's so disturbing to him that the guy walks away from faith. And it's not only so disturbing to him, it disturbs Jesus' followers because they're trying to freak out and grapple with what Jesus was saying in the first place. And, and, and so that's where we're finding ourselves starting out with talking about what Jesus is going to do in heaven. We're going to f- start with Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 and following. So if you could stand, please, as we read God's word. Just then a man came up to Jesus and, and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All of these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Which is interesting. Because a lot of people have pointed out that this guy's trying to self-justify himself, but I, I hear in him this nagging question, I've done it all, and I still don't have life. I have it all, and I still don't have life. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the man, young man heard this, He went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, truly I tell you, it's hard. It's hard for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? Because like, uh, pause, in, in, a, in, a, in a culture that understands that you're only as good as your actions, your morality, or your possessions, because clearly, if you're doing good, God's going to bless you, and, and if you're rich, clearly God must be blessing you. And so if this guy who has it all, who must be blessed by God, can't enter into eternal life, who possibly can? Verse 26, Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Peter answered him, we've, we've left everything to follow you. What then will there be for, for us? 
Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne and you, have followed, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. One of the things we see Jesus doing here is this. He is correcting, he's trying to derail something in this rich young man. And he's trying to let his disciples be front row seats to what he's trying to do. He's derailing this concept that I can actually center my life and I can invest all of my hopes and all of my dreams in what I have done morally, what I have done um, economically, vocationally, whatever. All those accolades, that, that actually is my identity and my hope. That's where it comes from. And Jesus is just throwing a hand grenade into that saying, nope, we're going to take you off that path completely. And the disciples are freaked out about that. Like, well, well what is it that we, I mean, if, if our hope is not in those things that we can show, look, look, I've done this, what is our hope in? And that's actually where we're going to start this morning. The thing that Jesus was trying to communicate in that passage has everything to do with hope. And this is kind of just a tease into what we're, it is that we're going to be talking about for the rest of the series. But we're talking about hope. Um, this is the team that just got back from uh, Haiti with some of our partners down in Haiti, our friends down there, um, and just an amazing trip that they experienced uh, partnering with the local church in Haiti. Uh, my son, Carson, he's, he's in uh, driver's ed right now um, over in Lockport. And his instructor was trying to set up a, a driving um, session. And and he wanted to do it while they were going to be in, in Haiti. And, and Carson said, oh, I can't do that. I'm out of the country. He's like, oh, really? You guys going on vacation somewhere? He's like, no, no. My mom and um, my older brother and, and some people from my church were going to Haiti. Why are you going to Haiti? Well, we're going to be partnering with the church down there and working with some of the orphanages and, and trying to do some work that's going to be encouraging our friends down in that country. <sighs> Look, Haiti is hopeless. You go down there and you do all that you're doing, you spend all the money that you're spending to get down there and you come back and you know how much has changed? Nothing. And Carson didn't know what to say because he's been to Haiti and he realizes how broken that country is. If, if you haven't been to Haiti, in my, the way that I describe it is Haiti is, everything in Haiti is broken except for the church. The government, you can't put your hope in the government, it's broken. You can't put your, your hope in local officials um, or, or people that are trying, the social standards or any, all that. It's all broken. Nothing, nothing works. But you see the hope of Christ within the church. And that's, that's the exciting thing. But one of the things that you have to prepare Americans for before they go down to Haiti is this. You're going to have massive culture shock because you're going to see very much what my, the driver's ed teacher for my son said, a hopeless situation. That's the first cultural blindside, the first cultural shock. But everyone that goes on these trips, they have a second culture shock when they leave. The second culture shock is when they reemerge everyday life that was normative, solid, put together. And something about the process of being in Haiti and seeing God work in the midst of the brokenness sensitizes their eyes to the fact that, whoa, we actually, there's a lot of broken pieces in my world that I've taken for granted, that I've been totally tone deaf to, that have been, been white noise to me, I haven't seen it, and yet it's been there all along. One of the things for people who are paying attention today feel is hopelessness. In fact, I, I would even say that we, we, we are currently in a crisis of hope. Within the past 20 years, um, antidepressants have, been, have risen to the third most prescribed medication. Now, I, I'm all for prescribed medication. I'm all for prescribed even, even antidepressants. It's helped uh, members of my family. Um, correct uh, chemical imbalances has been phenomenally helpful. A lot of people in our church, friends here, you know, have been greatly helped by way of some of these prescribed prescriptions. But we, you have to ask, what is going on if over the past 20 years this has risen to the level it has? Depression is currently the leading cause of disability worldwide. Suicide rates are skyrocketing. It is either the first, depending on the country, the first or second cause of death in young people. And if you've been paying attention to the news at all in 2018, the age that people actually take their life is going down 
down, down. People are taking their lives at, 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 at eight-year-old kids because they can't handle what's happening at school, end up taking their life. We are struggling with a crisis of hope. In 2012, uh, more soldiers in, in, in the war in Afghanistan died by, by their own hand in suicide than in combat. We are in a culture that is in a crisis of hope. Do you sense that? What do we do with that? Like, what do we do with, with the crisis of hope that we're currently living in? I'll tell you what people do. We buy shoes. At, at least if you're Esmelda Marcos. Back in the 80s, um, I don't know if you, how, some, I'm not going to have people raise their hands. Some of you were alive back then and were alive enough to be aware of what was happening uh, uh, globally. But back in the 80s, you have the Marcoses, uh, Esmelda, and she was married to Ferdinand power couple right there. And they were dictators in the Philippines, okay? And, and um, the thing, if you're a dictator, if you ever want to get into being a dictator, what you do is you're able to like be super, super powerful and have like live it up large. Like you're living a life of luxury and then you cause everyone else to be poor. It works super good until it doesn't. Because at some point, if this is your job, you know that at some point you're going to get ousted. And sure enough, the, the Marcoses were in 1986. And in 1986, they were ousted from uh, power and they, uh, the, the people of the Philippines raided the palace and Ismelda Marcos, she said, you know, they raided our, our, our house, they raided our palace and they raided our closets expecting to find skeletons and they didn't find any skeletons in my closet, only beautiful shoes. That's not how she sounds, but in my head, that's how Ismelda Marcos sounds. But they didn't find just like 10 pairs of beautiful shoes. They didn't find 100 pairs of beautiful shoes. The people, the poor people who are barefoot didn't find 150 pairs of beautiful shoes or 450 pairs of beautiful shoes or 750 pairs of beautiful shoes or 950 pairs of beautiful shoes. The people found between 1,060 and 7,500 pairs of beautiful shoes. If you wore a pair of these shoes, not me, but you, if you wore a pair of these beautiful shoes every day, wore them once and threw them away, after 10 years, you would still not have exhausted everything in your closet full of beautiful shoes. What in the world was Ismelda thinking? What was it that she was after? Like she couldn't possibly, these are beautiful pieces of, of shoe art. She couldn't possibly even enjoy or appreciate them. What was it that she was after that caused her to continue to gather more and more beautiful shoes? What was it? And as much as we can judge her, that's us. Because what we all do is we actually are all looking for a way to find something that is an answer to the fact that we are living in a crisis of hope. This is why it may not be tons and tons of beautiful shoes, but for you, it might be why you throw yourself into the addiction that, that is your pet addiction. Well, whether, whether you're totally addicted by investing tons of time into pornography or sports or hobbies or, or your work or become, being a workaholic or, or, or investing all of it, your hope and, hopes and dreams into a relationship, whatever that is, when we pour all of ourselves into that and, and thinking this is going, we're, we're hunting for something, we're looking for something, we're looking for an escape, escape from the crisis that we're experiencing living, or, or we're currently living in. And if somebody gets in the way of whatever it is that you've invested your hope in, whether it's a relationship or your addiction or your TV, whatever it is, or your game system, whatever it is, all of a sudden we react crazy town to it. Uh, the author um, of, of a book by the same title of the series that we're doing, All Things New by John Eldridge, it's a really good book. I encourage you to pick it up. We actually have some out by the hub. He, he put it this way, the world stands in the way of our famished craving. It constantly thwarts us. People don't treat us as we long to be treated. We can't find the happiness we need. Our boss is harsh, so we sabotage him. Our spouse withholds sex, so we indulge online. The ravening won't be stopped. But boy, oh boy, when somebody gets in the way of our desperate hunger, they feel the fury of our rage. We are ready to kill. People shoot each other over traffic incidents. Parents abuse a baby who keeps them up at night. We, venge, we vengefully crucify one another in social media. Last night, um, after the service, I wanted to find some, some real-life examples of this. And so I just went and I just did a search for Google News, one of the worst mistakes I've ever made. I went to bed so depressed, more depressed than I've been in months. 
as I read through incident after incident after incident, an Illinois man down in Florida, his girlfriend's daughter spilled her juice box, her, her juice on, on his Xbox, and in a rage, he killed her. In New Mexico, a boyfriend and girlfriend, their daughter um, was just keeping them up way too late, and they continued to beat her until she died. And then they buried her, telling a neighbor that it was their dog in the yard until they eventually surfaced the reality that, Where, where's your daughter? I found out what had happened. I found six examples of that. Something happening to a little child in the last 72 hours. What is happening to us? We are unhinged. And even, um, like, if, uh, there's a lot of talk about R. Kelly and, and um, this documentary that came out last week. And apparently this dude has done some super sketchy stuff, awful, and, and, and oppressive and abusive. And, and it's like, it's finally, it's, it's a sense of justice is coming, and that's, that's so good. But what fascinated me when I was doing the search last night was what the creator of the documentary, Surviving R. Kelly, said about why she was making this documentary. She says this, I don't have hope in the criminal justice system. I would love a social death for R. Kelly. Our response is this. This, this, is, this is the normative natural response. And this is why we react to hopelessness out of proportion because our hope in all of these things that we normally would have hope in have dissipated, they've disappeared. We are living untethered. There used to be in society, you could trust the cops. But in society, you know, there's, a, there's an uprising. Can we really trust our, the people who are in power? We used to be able to trust our government. My son, my son, Micah, he's 18 years old. In his 18 years of life, he has never known in the United States of America what it looks like to disagree well between Republicans and Democrats. Not once. And, and, and so you get a chance to, to grow up with that where you're untethered to, to, to people that you trust. The, 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 the workplaces, the companies that used to be, you got into a company and you were with that company for life. But now people are like, I can't stay with the same company. I don't even trust them. They have their own interests. Even unions, people are, are losing, like losing their hope in, in the union because they're not being represented well enough. And the church, there are so many people today who would never say they're atheists maybe agnostics, but, but honestly, just very spiritual people. But here's the thing. I just don't have any faith in, the or, in organized religion. They have let me down. They have disappointed me. They have wronged. Clearly, my hope is not in them. Untethered from any, any one of these things, we end up trying to find our hope and searching for hope and searching for those answers on our own. We have lost it. We are currently living in a state where we've lost hope. And the truth is, we need a stronger hope than any one of these things affords. What we're talking about today is we can't possibly start talking about how Jesus viewed eternity, how Jesus described the afterlife without this very, very pr primary, just primary perspective and understanding, which undergirded everything that he said, and it was hope. And so we're going to look to see what Jesus has to say about three questions regarding that. Number one, what is hope? Secondly, wh what is our hope rooted in? And third, what is it that we're truly hoping for? First off, what, what is hope? A biblical perspective on this, but it's, it's one that meshes with any, any perspective on hope is this. A good definition is this. Hope is a confident anticipation that good is coming. This is so foundational, we got to say this together, so let's just go ahead and say it together. Hope is a confident anticipation that good is coming. If you believe this, you have hope. Now, you might be delusional, you might have hope in something stupid dumb, right? But that's what hope is. It's a confident, I'm confident, confident anticipation that good is coming. It's the thing that in a, in a sea where everything is like this, it tethers you, it anchors you. This is why the author of Hebrews, when describing a Christian's perspective based on Jesus, says this, we have this hope. We have this hope as what? An anchor. When everything is like this, when everything in life is like this, we have an anchor. Now, if you're like south of 18 years old, how many of, how many of us in here, you're younger than 18? Just go ahead and raise your hand. Okay. You know how grown-ups oftentimes go, oh, just enjoy it now. Life is so much harder. <laughs> like, life is brutal. It's terrible. It's hard. It's like, oh, I'm sounding like Donald Trump. I don't know. <laughs> 
It's awful. It's terrible. It's hard. And, and it's, it's, it's like, you know, you just enjoy it now. All you have to do is like worry about homework and stuff. They, you know how they say that, that, those types of things. Truth is, honestly, teenage years are full of anxiety. And they're, it's crazy town, nerve-wracking, being a teenager. And adults forget that. But the reason that grown-ups say that is this. As a teenager, you still have hope <laughs> that if I get the right job, the right marriage, the right car, the right house, that everything's going to come true. This is why we play that MASH game, right? The mansion, apartment, you know, shack, house. We play that game because we're like, if we get the right lineup of all the right things, then all of a sudden, boom, we're going to be a happy person. And then you get them, or at least a lot of them. And the reason that adults look at life as brutal is because they're brutally disappointed that it didn't step up to the plate and give everything that we were hoping for. Our hopes were far too weak and shallow compared to what we truly need. What is hope? It is a confident anticipation that good is coming. But it's not built and based on those things. It is coming from the anchor. But rooted in what? Like, what, what is our hope rooted in? The author of uh, the first letter to the church in Corinth, Paul, he, he ta- starts talking about in this, this very, very famous passage about love. If you've gone to any weddings, they probably have chucked 1 Corinthians 13 in there somewhere because he's saying, we've got to love people and this love is different. It's, it's, it's a love that comes from God. And, and he's like, okay, you're going to deal with lots of difficult people. Maybe your spouse, maybe someone, but all these people that you're dealing with that are difficult, you have a different framework to, to react to the difficulty and it's Jesus. Jesus is, is, is not only your savior, he's the one that we're modeling our life off of. And then he gets to this verse. Look, these three things last. The word for last is mano um, in, in Greek, and it means remain or endure, or uh, some translations even says, say go on forever. These three things are like lifers, faith, hope, and love. And then what does it say after that? But the greatest of these is love. Here's why. You need love now. If you're a follower of Jesus, that's, that's part of your DNA because cause, cause 1 John tells us that God is love. We need love now. And then in eternity, after we die, we are still with God. God is love. Love is going to be a part of that reality in eternity. So we need that now and we need that then. Love is all the way through. But we don't need the first two in eternity. We don't need the first two in heaven. You don't need hope in heaven. Why? Because everything you're hoping for has been, real. Your, your hope is realized. You don't need to hope in something that's there. You don't need faith. The author of Hebrews says that faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you cannot see. Well, you can see it. You're going to see Jesus face to face. And so as much as those first two aren't necessary in eternity, the reason why love supersedes them is it does. We need faith and hope as these two life forces that God gives us as instruments now. But you know what your hope is rooted in? If it's rooted in anything, it's rooted in your faith. It's rooted in your faith. It's you actually saying, I am, I'm actually putting my hope in that. I'm putting my hope in my faith, in, in, in what my faith is actually aiming to find and, and secure for me. First Corinthians 13 talks about that. So hope is this constant, it's, it's, this, it's this confident anticipation, good is coming, it's gonna come. And it's not coming from me, it's not coming from my ability to, to fix my life, it's not, my hope isn't the fact that I'm gonna make things better, it's in the fact that Jesus did That when Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the grave, not only told me about how much he loves me and my identity is in him, but he rose from the grave, which means that I've got confidence that he can do what he he said he can do. If you don't believe people, totally just like blind, blind faith belief. If someone says, give me your car keys, I'm gonna take your car and I'm gonna actually wash your car for you. I'm not gonna charge you for it. If you don't know this person, you give them your keys. You're like, yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Go for it. No, you would never do that. Why? I don't know you. I don't know if you have, I don't know if you might be being honest, but you might be a terrible driver. You may not have the ability to see. And if you don't have the ability to see, or or if you don't have a track record, how could I possibly put my faith and my hope in you? As Christians, the reason that we have hope in what Jesus has to promise us in eternity is because we're looking back to what he did on the cross. If someone says that they can actually wipe out our sin, if someone says that they'll actually rise from the grave and they do it, you can trust that person. What is our hope rested? What's it rooted in? Jesus. Our confident anticipation that good is coming is rooted in Jesus. 
One of the things that, that kills everything in our world is a hopelessness. It's what kills marriages, is what kills relationships. We give up hope. It's what kills your ability to finish a race that you're running in. I don't, I, I don't think I can do this. You give up hope, it's over, game over. However, if your hope is built and rooted in something greater than your own ability, then you understand that you've got the capacity to finish the race. Faith is what is rooted, rooting our hope. Our hope is our, in our faith in Jesus. But what is it that we're hoping for? Because this is the cool thing, that Jesus doesn't just get ambi- super ambiguous with his disciples and say, okay, follow me, put your hope in me. Well, what are we hoping for? Just me, just me, that's all it is. He actually spells it out. He actually, in fact, Jesus gets into something so specific. He starts talking about this thing called the kingdom, a coming kingdom. And that was really good news for them because they're being oppressed by the Roman Empire at the time. And so for them, they're realizing, whoa, we're gonna have a different kingdom, like a different king and different kingdom. And Jesus is, yeah, but, but just like in that passage we read, he's helping them understand that it's different than they anticipate. But this was something so key to what Jesus was saying. Look, I wanna tell you what you're hoping towards, that he, that he goes in like this. We see um, it all across the gospels. Twice in Matthew, it's, Jesus, this is what happens. Jesus travels throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about what? Okay, growing up in church, I never understood this idea of the kingdom. I thought that was just just dumb. Didn't we like 200 years ago declare independence from a kingdom? Kingdoms are lame. Why would would we start, why would we talk about something so archaic? It's so not archaic when we realize what Jesus is saying. There is a king and there's a kingdom and he's a better king and this is a better kingdom than whatever it is that you're orienting your life around. So he travels all over the place. He, it's almost the same verse. In the same book by the same author, we see the same thing. that Jesus is still doing this. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of what? The kingdom. And what, what was it? What was it that he was saying? The time, this is Jesus talking, the time promised by God has come at last. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Now this is, that, that phrase right there, that's what you hear like the guy with the bullhorn out on the, the corner in Chicago screaming at you. Repent, the kingdom of God is near. And you're just like, whoa. Okay, just separate out, divorce out that picture from what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying this. You have been aiming and rooting and tethering your hope on things that have sent you disappointed. The kingdom, a better king and a better kingdom than you're worshiping and you're all about right now is near. And so you're, there's a response to that. It's repent. And what repent is this. You are going and investing yourself in your life this way. It doesn't work. I would be, I would be hateful if I told you to just keep going on that and just tack me onto it. No, jump off that track, derail yourself from that track and go the opposite direction. This is the good news. This is the great news that you've been waiting for. This is the, the great news that you've been living your whole life trying to find. Young man, you are rich You are rich, but your life is absorbed by that. That's where your hope comes from. Separate yourself out from that. Even give all of that to to who I am, and you're going to find something where you're liberated. This kingdom is better than that. As long as you have a hope that's built and based on the next paycheck being your salvation, you'll never experience the kingdom. As long as you have a hope that's built and based on the relationship mending or becoming all that you want it to be or, or maybe getting a relationship. As long as that's where your hope is, you'll never experience the hope that overcomes all of this. You'll never experience the kingdom. As long as your hope is in, in people liking you and approving of you or your GPA being good enough or your job being good enough or, or what you own being good enough, as long as your hope are in any of those things, you will never ever understand the hope that overcomes all things and you'll never understand the kingdom. You just won't. So Jesus is like, I want to derail every one of these false paths. Turn around, repent, and believe the good news. How, often, how many of us in here, we have cell phones? Just go and raise your hand if you have a cell phone. Does anyone not have a cell phone? Okay. All right. Yeah, okay. Some people who are too young for cell phones. That's okay. All right. <laughs> So, so we, have, we have some like six-year-old, yeah, got a great data, no, great. Okay, all of us who've got uh, cell phones, how often do you check your cell phone? Like once or twice a day? <laughs> the average is 110 times. 
The average is that we spend one third of our waking hours on our device. Why? What is it we're looking for? What is it that we're looking for on that device? You know what it is? Good news. We're hoping to be validated. Someone likes something that we've posted. Or we feel connected because we know what the scores of the game before someone else. We, we, we know what someone has, has interacted with us or, or resolution to a fight that was happening. We're, we're desperately looking for good news. That's what's driving that insatiable hunger to be on your device all the time is that you feel a bit of an escape from the bad. What does Jesus say? Don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. And this good news of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. What is it that we are truly looking for? We are looking for the kingdom that he has come. And what that is, is described in the passage we started out with. Jesus dovetails away from talking about this rich young ruler and he's talking to his disciples. You want to know what you're hoping for? You want to know what you're looking forward to? It's not power. It's not prestige. This is it. Truly, I tell you, at the renewal of all things. Renewal in Greek, the Greek word used there is it's a compound word of palingencia. And the last word, genesia, we know this word to be kind of like genesis. It's the word that means beginning. And the first word, palin, comes from the word again. What Jesus is saying is when everything begins again. When you have a fresh start because of me, when I have given you the blank slate, the renewal of all things, when the renewal of all things happens, and this is the best thing, because escapism is not just found in your addictions, it's not just found in your hobbies, it's not just found in our relationships, we find escapism in every religion. Every religion on planet earth says this, believe the right things, do the right things, and you're going to have some type of escape, nirvana, some type of, uh, of getaway, some type of like better reality or, or existence, it's heaven. It's this idea of if you believe the right stuff, you can evacuate away from the stress of your marriage, evacuate yourself out of the difficulty of this life, and you're going to be able to leave all the problems behind you, and one day I'll fly away. But this evacuation plan is not something that Jesus talks about. Jesus doesn't say, when I evacuate you off this crummy planet, he says, at the renewal, at the new beginning, Eden restored, when all things are made new again, when I take all that is bad and I unwire it and I restore the good, when that happens, that is where your hope is. That is the kingdom that he's talking about. That is the hope that we have that we're looking forward to. It changes everything. Uh, Randy Alcorn, his book on heaven, said, puts it this way. In heaven, to look into God's eyes, we'll just see what we've always longed to see. The person who made us for his own good pleasure. Seeing God will be like seeing everything else for the first time. Uh, C.S. Lewis, he, he talks about this. He says, it would seem that our Lord finds our des desires not too strong, but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of, the ho of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. All Jesus is saying is this, your hope is too weak. There's a stronger hope there's a hope that overcomes all these things. It's not optimism. It's not luck. It's not coincidences. It's not you. It's me. There's a confident anticipation that good is coming that you can have today that's rooted in me. And you know who gets that? You know who understands that for real? Nelta. Nelta totally understands that. This is Nelta. Uh, Nelta is one of the, the people, um, one of the young ladies, she's 14 years old, um, she lives in Jehovah Rapha house, it's a special needs house um, that our, our church has the privilege of partnering with. Um, Nelta is one of the coolest people that you're ever going to meet if you ever, ever go down to Haiti. Um, when Nelta was born, she was born with cerebral palsy. And so her brain is super sharp, she's totally lucid, she totally understands, but she has a difficulty communicating um, on top of that, all of her muscles in her body contract in such a way that her, her hips are always consistently pulled out of joint. 
And so her, her hips are always out of whack. She'll never walk. She's, she's always um, kind of in a crouching position on the floor. She'll never stand up straight, ever. And to get across the room, she has to like drag herself across the room. That's Nelta. She's in pain every single day of every one of her, uh, for her whole life. And it's more than just physical pain. She, her dad, when she was born, seeing her condition, looked at it as a voodoo curse. And just like you would want to get something radioactive out of your house, he looked at his daughter as something he needed to get out of his house to protect the rest of the family. And so he took Nelta to the middle of the street, hoping that a car would hit her and left her there. Pastor Dari found her. He's the guy who runs, he and his wife, this orphanage for kids with special needs. But Nelta, I mean, her whole existence is in this house with white concrete walls surrounded by cinder block walls in a busy, busy area of Port-au-Prince. They don't get a chance to get out to go to school for the most part, most of them. And, and most of them, if they, they're lucky to get to church, that's like a big win for them. But a lot of times it's just trying to help the kids get through day-to-day life in this compound, concrete walls. And so what Julie and the team decided to do was to do something for them that they've never experienced, which was to take Nelta and the whole crew to the ocean, which sounds like that's not really missions work. That sounds like vacation, <laughs> except if you've never seen the ocean. If your understanding of life is the four walls of an orphanage where all you hear are cries and screams and you're reminded of your inability to do what other people could, something like this is a game changer. Um, Alyssa Mayfield wrote an amazing blog about this. We're gonna link it on NBC's Facebook page because she talks about this experience of bringing these kids from the two orphanages we get a chance to work with to the ocean. And it was so awesome to see the kids from Jehovah Rapha. Now, the kids from Jehovah Rapha, a lot of them, they can't walk like Nelta. So people like Mason carried Nelta. And Nelta was beaming, beaming with joy. They put her on, on, a, on a towel, and she gets a chance to see the ocean, just smelling the ocean and seeing the sight that she had only imagined. She never had possibly dreamed, but it's right here in front of her. It was just the word that the team used to describe it was one word, and the one word was joy. And all of a sudden, uh, they realized, we need, to get, we need to get Nelta into the water. And so sure enough, they bring Nelta right into the water, and she's just beaming. And she's like, this is amazing. She's, she's blown away with this. Franzi, uh, he's, he's one of the guys in uh, the special needs orphanage who can't see. By the way, that guy can see more than anyone else I, I, possible, I can possibly imagine, but he can't see a thing with his eyes. He's just he's super blind. But as he's on the swing set at the beach, he's just like, I can see God. What is it about experiencing something that where everything is just right that gives us a deeper hunger and longing for eternity? You know, Nelta, the thing about Nelta is this. What does a person with her condition, how does she get through every day? Because when you find her in the orphanage, this is the way she's smiling. She's not delusional. She's sharp as a tack. She understands everything. It's interesting because they gave, at one point, they gave an opportunity to pass around the microphone in the orphanage for kids to say or do different things that they wanted to respond in a Bible study. And so she had the microphone. What is Nelta going to say? What is someone who experiences pain every minute of every day of their life, who has the background experience of her father abandoning her for death, what does a person like that say into a microphone? What is a person who has experienced um, asking God for healing and God hasn't helped her in that? What do they do and say? Nelta grabs the microphone, and she doesn't say anything. She sings it. What does she sing? What does someone like that sing? God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. Do you have Nelta's hope? Because it's not based on her circumstances or her conditions. The prayers that have not been answered by God in the way that she would love. But this young lady has a hope that is a confident anticipation that good is coming. May we be the people who are breaking out of the, the concrete walls of our expectations and our perspectives and all the things that we define by bringing us down 
and recognize that what God has for us is far greater than we could possibly dream or imagine in Christ, in him. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we repent to the fact that we put our trust and our hope in things to fill us up and fulfill us, things we draw our identity from, things that honestly would bring anybody down, but we've allowed to overcome any aspect of joy in our world. God, we're asking that you cause in us a shift in perspective, that we can have hope in the midst of pain, a confident hope, a confident anticipation that in you, Jesus, good is coming, that the only good that we have to hope for is found in you, the only hope that will not disappoint is in you, that that will be the cry of our heart, that we'll be able to operate on that Sunday through Saturday through good times and bad. And we will see what you're doing and accomplishing for your glory through us. It's in Jesus' name we pray this and all God's people said.